Okay, so um, over the next hour or so, what I want to tell you about are some problems which were inspired for me by this book um, from whom, or I have essentially stolen the title on growth and form geometry, physics, and biology. And so for those of you who don't know, um, I think everybody over here does, but for those of you who don't know, you sh it's a wonderful book. It was published, uh, first edition is 1917. It's 1,000 pages um, in its first edition, written by this Scottish polymath on the right side, um, Darcy Thompson, who was a mathematician, a biologist, a classical scholar, and who espoused a view from the beginning that it is possible, it should be possible to try and understand biological questions from a mathematical and physical perspective. And he used analogy repeatedly right through the book, so much so that he in fact said uh, at the beginning of the book and again at the end that the whole book is but an introduction and a, 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 a call to arms to try and use mathematical ideas to, to understand problems in biology, in particular problems associated with size and shape. Uh, of which the Nautilus is a beautiful example. And I want to start by essentially, uh, and then I'll finish with a different quote, I want to start by saying what he do does in the beginning um, uh, of this book. He says, the problems of form are for the first instance, are in the first instance mathematical problems, the problems of growth are physical problems, and the morphologist is ipso facto a student of physical science. Uh, so he was interested in it from a geometrical point of view. Now biologists are interested in form and shape for a different reason, because that essentially provides the basis for a lot of function. And it perhaps is useful to essentially compare uh, what an architect, very famous architect, Lewis Sullivan said uh, uh, of architecture, in which he said that, in fact, form ever follows function. Okay, namely, you build things because you are trying to essentially get something done. And in biology, often, not always, function ever follows form. And of course, the two start talking to each other. And that's why in developmental biology, in biology in general, we care about shape, we care about size, we care about um, uh, um, number. Um, for example, at the level of a single cell, this is a, a Vibrio cholera, a, a single cell uh, prot protist, um, uh, and it has a rod-shaped uh, uh, structure. You can have uh, other single cell organisms which have spheres. You can have ones which are crescent-shaped, and each one of these shapes allows the bacteria or the protist to move, to form patterns, to form colonies, which are, are, are important in the life cycle of the bacterium at the level of a single cell. If you look at slightly larger situations uh, where you have a large number of cells, so here are organs, in this case flowers and, and leaves, uh, there is a tremendous variety, a tremendous variety in shape, tremendous variety in size. For example, you can have a lily over here, which I'll tell you briefly about later on, which is a few centimeters in size, or you could have algal blades, which can be, and this is not to scale except for the last uh, set of pictures, um, uh, an algal blade which can be typically meters in length centimeters in width and millimeters in thickness. So tremendous variety in size, tremendous variety in shape, so much so that Darwin 150 years ago, when he tried to essentially make sense of this, uh, said on the diversity of plant form, it's enough to make even the sanest man mad. 50 years later, famous physicist who got the Nobel Prize in chemistry, Rutherford, perhaps talking about botany said, all science is either physics or stamp collecting. But I think it's important to collect stamps, because unless you collect the stamps, you don't know what the patterns are that you're trying to explain. And I'm sure Rutherford was aware of this, and that's the view that, in fact, a lot of people, including me, take towards biological problems. How do we essentially pick examples, paradigms in biology from which I can understand general principles if there are such general principles? Okay, so it is important to essentially collect stamps, uh, and it's important to collect stamps to try and understand the general pattern. So you can go all the way to the organism. I have this picture uh, for two reasons. One, because the blue whale is uh, uh, the biggest animal that we know uh, has, that's ever existed on our planet. But secondly, also, it's actually adapted wonderfully to water. You take the whale out and you put it on, on a beach and it will die. And it dies even though it's an air-breathing mammal. It dies because its organs get crushed by its own weight. So size and shape become very, very important uh, and are responsible for how physiology essentially can work. So what's the perspective that we'd like to take, that I'd like to take uh, in, in trying to understand these kinds of questions from a physical and from a mathematical point of view? Probably the most important thing is a lot of biological shape is self-organized and self-regulated. Um, it's also not an equilibrium. The only equilibrium in biology is when you're six feet under, essentially dead. And in a mathematical perspective, the one that I essentially would like to espouse is in all these problems associated with shape, geometry, to some extent topology, and dynamics occur in three dimensions, which is actually very, very nasty. 
thing as I'm going to try and explain to you. So if one wanted to ask these questions either from a mathematical or a physical point of view, then we want to try and build models. And as Darcy Thompson himself espoused, these models could be physical models. That means to say I write down equations based on the laws of physics, or they could be physical analogies. I can essentially take objects which have patterns in biology and ask whether these similar patterns arise in, in inanimate situations. And I'll give you examples of this as we go through. And if we can do this, and we can do this from one example to the other, can we then use these examples to construct an abstraction or a metaphor which eventually leads perhaps to a general mathematical description? If, on the other hand, you were approaching this from a biological point of view, we are interested in, one's interested in the principles of development, and you want to try and compare different organisms, and you, by comparing these different organisms using a comparative perspective, perhaps you can get, again, general principles from a biological point of view. And if you wanted to now expand and extend that, not just for what's happening today at different places in, 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 in the world, or, but also over deep time, then we're trying to understand how these shapes essentially can be classified. What number of parameters or how hard or how easy is it to essentially quantify what Darwin essentially said, this incredible diversity in shape? Where are these morphospaces? This is not a new subject. It's a very old subject. Um, but over the last 20 or 30 years, there have been some tremendous advances, primarily on very small scales, trying to understand which genes are turned on, which genes are turned off, how different cells are talking to each other through signaling, which receptors are exposed, which ligands bind to which ones, how the cell tries to build external uh, a skeleton uh, uh, um, associated with the extracellular matrix, how these cells come together, how they move, how they change their number, how they change their shape, how they change their size, all these essentially have now a, 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 a reasonably good basis at the level of a cell or below. An older, much older tradition, going back to Darcy Thompson, had focused on what happened on the larger scale, but again, primarily through analogy. And what I'd like to do is to try and, at, at, at a crude level, focus on the questions that Darcy Thompson already raised, how what happens at the cell leads to changes in the properties of the tissue, leads to changes in the amount of material that's essentially formed as the biological organism takes external material and converts it to itself, how do forces and, 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 and force balance, how does mass conservation lead to these complex geometries? Okay? So how can we essentially take what's happening at the molecular and the cellular level and try and make sense of what is happening at the mesoscopic level is a basic question that arises in morphology. And if morphology then leads to physiology, and then physiology leads to how the organism essentially interacts with the environment, then perhaps in some examples it may be possible to close the loop. We can't do that yet in any example that I actually know. So my focus over the next hour or so is going to be trying to ask questions at that scale inspired by what we know on the molecular scale, but not necessarily taking into account all the details. So if you like, perhaps these are ways in which, uh, from a mathematical and physical point of view, we are trying to make caricatures, cartoon models, which have parameters. And these parameters depend on what's happening at different scales. And with these parameters, we want to try and construct these morphospaces. How hard or how easy is it to essentially change shape when you go from one place to the other in biology? OK, and I'll do that by focusing on two examples. And then there will be digressions through uh, the talk uh, relative to what we can learn both from these examples, but also how you can move from one example to a broader class of questions. The first one focuses on a single cell. And I'm going to take a very large cell. And the typical place where you find very large cells in biology are in plants. Plant cells are walled, unlike animal cells. Animal cells have a membrane. Plant cells have more than that. They have a relatively stiff wall. They're also like bacteria. And I want to focus on a pollen tube, which probably you remember from high school biology. A pollen tube is essentially a long protrusion that grows from a pollen grain. The pollen grain typically is of the order of 50 to 100 microns long. And the fundamental question that I'd like to essentially start to address is to ask how do you essentially characterize the shape? How do you characterize the dynamics? How do you characterize the stability of this? And why is this important? It's important because the pollen tube essentially is an important critical half in the process of fertilization, where the male gamete, the pollen grain, essentially has uh, um, uh, half the chromosomes, which essentially then are, are, are deposited on the female in the pistil, and the pollen tube grows 
by a process which involves navigation, uh, it grows to essentially form a, a, a link between the pollen grain and, 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 um, and the ovum. And then through this tube, you essentially have the nucleus which moves, leading to fertilization, whose fruits then you eventually literally consume as fruits. OK, so the work that I want to tell you about was done primarily with two postdocs, O.J. Campos and Garrett Jones. O.J. is now at Santa Barbara. Garrett Jones is at uh, uh, the National University of Singapore. And in very strong collaboration with Jacques Dumais' group, uh, then uh, he was originally at Harvard. Now he is in Chile and a postdoc of his Enrique Rojas. The second problem that I want to tell you about, I'll introduce the two problems and I'll dive in, is a problem associated with the whole organ, uh, in this case the gut, which is also a tube. It's a tube which you just used to consume some of the goodies outside. Um, and the question is how the gut is patterned. Now, here is an image of the gut of a chick. Uh, so this object, as I said, is of the order of tens of microns. This is an object which in you and me is a few meters in length. This is in the chick. Uh, 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 during the process of embryogenesis, where you see essentially this wonderfully coiled structure, which is about two centimeters long. And this is a problem that was introduced to me by Cliff Tabin, a geneticist at Harvard Medical School. And we had a very close collaboration with his group, primarily Amy Shire and Natasha Kurpios, who did some of the embryological experiments and some of the experiments and the theories that were done from a physical and biophysical point of view were done in my group uh, with Thierry Savin and Thomas Tallinn. The perspective, and in fact, the takeaway message I'll give you immediately in both these problems is already espoused very, very eloquently by Darcy Thompson uh, in the book that I just referred to, in which he says that an organism is so complex a thing and growth so complex a phenomena that for growth to be uniform and constant is both unlikely and unusual. So different parts are going to grow at different rates. So rates vary, proportions change, and the whole configuration is altered accordingly. So it's really simple. If I have a piece of matter and this piece of matter can aggregate or shrink at different rates at different locations, immediately you're going to get tremendous variety of form. That's it. That's the whole message. The question is now, how do I take that and convert it to something which we can essentially use to quantify some of these shapes? So everything that I'm going to tell you could have, in fact, been done 100 years or more ago. And in fact, again, I think it's, it's useful to quote, um, at least I like to quote this uh, phrase from Alan Turing, uh, who Darcy Thompson focused on the physical basis of morphogenesis to a large extent. Alan Turing, whose centenary was celebrated a year ago, said in his very famous paper, The Chemical Basis of Morphogenesis, and in the introduction to that, he says the theory makes no new hypothesis. It merely suggests that certain well-known physical facts are sufficient to account for many, uh, uh, well-known physical laws are sufficient to account for the facts. Okay, so everything that I'm going to do is based on extremely simple laws which have been known for a very long time. What has happened is that we have the ability to do quantitative experiments, we have the ability to essentially do calculations, we have the ability to do some computations, and we have the ability to compare. That's what's really changed. Okay, so I want to dive right in. And I want to tell you first about the shape of walled cells. As I told you, animal cells are very different from plant cells in a fundamental way. Plant cells have cell walls, and the cell walls are primarily uh, large molecular weight sugars, pectin, callose, cellulose. Pectin is the stuff that you find, for example, in your yogurt. Okay? Uh, you also have wall cells in other uh, uh, um, uh, species, not just in plants. You have them in fungi. You also have them in bacteria. In bacteria, they're very different. Uh, they're made of peptidoglycans uh, uh, rather than these large molecular weight sugars. Uh, you also have proteins involved in them. I won't tell you about bacteria today, although I will indicate how what happens in plant cells and what happens in fungi is different. I indicated the size. I want to now show you, uh, again, the same thing, but dynamically. So this is a pollen grain, which has a diameter typically of the order of a few hundreds or tens of microns to 100 microns. That pollen grain has a tube which can extrude out of that pollen grain at a velocity of the order of a few microns a, a, a minute, so relatively easy to see in, in, a, in a simple optical microscope. Um, and that pollen grain, the pollen tube, has a wall which can be between 50 to 150 nanometers thick. So it's a relatively thin-walled object, uh, which has a, a, a large size. And already, there should be a puzzle uh, that should have posed itself, because I told you that pollen grains and, 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 and plant cells are essentially walled. I have to tell you one more thing, that they are like balloons. 
because you have a high concentration of proteins and salts inside relative to the outside, therefore water likes to move in, and if water likes to move in, this whole thing is under pressure. And if it's under pressure, it's working like a balloon, it's acting like a balloon, but if it's acting like a balloon, you know that if you blow a balloon, it tends to become spherical. But this is not spherical, it essentially forms a tube. So you have an isotropic pressure, and that pressure is somehow converted to an anisotropic growth form. So that's an interesting geometrical, mathematical, physical question. Okay, so here is an enlarged view of this pollen grain. And I've shown this over here, and I'll show you a, a, a dynamical image, a dynamical movie of this in a minute, to emphasize that there are two ways in which these objects can grow. You can add material to the object everywhere along it at the same time, uniformly or non-uniformly, or uh, you could add material primarily at the tip, which means that essentially nothing is happening uh, near the back, a lot of activity near the tip, and whatever is happening at the back happened a long time ago. So essentially, you just have a history which is being laid out for you. You can watch this. So this has been sped up by three or four times. This, this dimension over here is of the order of 10 microns. So this is a pollen uh, a grain from a lily, uh, which is now growing. And you can actually see that all the activity is limited to a small zone near the tip. That's why it's called tip growth. What happens at the back? is essentially just a remnant of the past. OK. Sure. Ah, I'm going to come to that. I'm going to come to that. Yes, indeed. You have to have. So actually, maybe I'll ask the question. I'll try to answer the question immediately. So of course, if I'm trying to grow an object, and I want to essentially add new material, that material has to come from somewhere. And that, come, that, that material coming is, in fact, what you actually see. So there is flow of material. And that material is enclosed in vesicles. And these vesicles are attached by molecular motors to filaments of actin. And these vesicles then are transporting material to the tip. The vesicles lyse. They release the new material. When they release the new material, that new material then is partly added to the wall. And if now, and I'm basically uh, what's, going to, what's going to come in, in a couple of minutes, and then that wall, if it's fluid enough, will start to expand in response to the difference in pressure between the inside and the outside. So there is an exquisite regulation that you need, because if I had too much or too little, you're going to be in trouble. And I, that's, that's the basic question. How do you regulate the amount of material that's added in order for you to have this steady state? Okay. And incidentally, since, uh, well, OK. All right, so now this is something which, again, not only in the context of balloons, but if you, if, if you think about artistic activities like glass blowing, then you actually realize that this is exactly what a glass blower uses. Okay, so a glass blower will heat glass, but non-uniformly, and then blow. When you increase the temperature, you essentially go from the solid or the glassy state to a liquid state. And, and as a consequence of increasing the pressure, you essentially have flow, but the flow is localized, and you get all these beautiful forms. They can happen in the lab, in glass blowing. They also happen in nature. On the right side over here, I've shown you a lava tube, which is a consequence of something very, very similar except now it's driven by fluid pressure in the inside, and it's cooling because of radiation being exposed. Okay? And again, going back to Darcy Thompson, he said glass blowers have lessons for both the naturalist and the physicist, so both the biologist and the physicist. It's the same principle. You are inhomogeneously changing the properties of the material, and by changing the inhomogeneous properties of the material, you're converting a homogeneous pressure to shape. How does that happen is the basic question. Okay. The fact that you're converting the pressure into directional growth allows you to think of this as a macroscopic engine. It's an engine which is important because it essentially can burrow through the pistil and eventually reach the ovum in a flower. Uh, and if it's an engine, you can calculate, you can ask, what are the black box properties of the engine? So I want to start, as I, as I told you before, I want to think about uh, uh, looking at this at different levels. I first take a very coarse black box view of this as an engine which is driven by pressure. Then we dive in and ask what's happening. Can we understand the shape? Can we understand the speed? Can we understand the stability? And then what, what remains to be said next? Okay? So, so here is an example uh, of an experiment done, and it's even more visible over here now than in the previous one, where you see vesicles coming up to the tip. You see there's a zone near the tip where you don't see the vesicles, and that's primarily because the vesicles over there are few in their intact form. They've essentially lysed. And when they've lysed, they've got enzymes which essentially soften the cell wall over there, 
and they also have new material. So you have both these kinds of materials. It's pushing against an obstacle. That obstacle is just a, an elastic filament. And so by pushing against the obstacle, you can measure the forces because you know how much it deflects. And of course, you can measure its velocity. So a characteristic of an engine that you, that you want to often try to understand and try to characterize are the force velocity characteristics, the torque speed relation. So here is an engine, and I'm trying to characterize the, the relationship between the force and the velocities. And I'm going to show you now what the data looks like. It's scattered. It's all over the place. And the reason it's all over the place is because these diameters are not necessarily all the same, and they depend enormously on the environment. Okay? So the first and the most important thing to point out in this, in, this, in this figure are the numbers. So the forces are of the order of micronewtons, 10 to the minus 6 newtons, and the velocities are of the order of microns per second. Um, why am I showing you this? Why am I telling you this? Because I want to compare this. I want to compare this with what people have measured in the last 20 years at the level of a single molecule, uh, motor molecules like myosin, for example, or kinesin. And what they find are three orders of magnitude smaller numbers for the forces and three orders smaller magnitude for the velocities. No surprises here, because of course, this is a mesoscopic engine. So I have a large number of uh, if you want, this is equivalent to having a large number of motors working in unison. And these motors are at, at a crude level associated with whatever is bringing the material over there. Of course, the real motor is the turgor. You basically have a difference in pressure between the inside and the outside, which is driving it. What's also interesting is the shape. That's it's very, very strongly convex or concave, depending on your perspective and how, what you define as convex or concave in this case. So it's very, very uh, the velocity is almost a constant until you reach a critical force, and then you stall dramatically. Why does that happen? Well, if you look at this carefully, if you look at the experiment carefully, you actually see immediately why it's happening. It'll, it'll run through the first time. Um, and if I wait, so it touches, and you see that the, that the tip starts to flatten. So what happens is that as soon as you have a hemispherical, an approximately hemispherical end, which comes and touches the glass plate or the cantilever. It has contact at a point, and then it starts to flatten. And if it starts to flatten, it's exerting forces over a larger and larger area until you can't sustain the force over a long slender object. The whole thing essentially deforms. And so that's it. That's all that you, that you need in order to explain that. Again, you can make it quantitative, but for, this, uh, uh, for, for our purposes at this point, the only thing that's relevant is to point out that, in fact, this is a very strong uh, uh, constant velocity over a large range of forces, and then it just falls off. And the reason for that is indicated in that diagram over there. The pressure is able to act over a larger and larger area until the whole thing stall, quote, stalls, and it stalls because this large object just bends over. OK, so this is the black box picture of an individual pollen grain. But as Andy asked me, if you want to try and understand what's going on, we've got to understand what's happening in the inside. And I've already told you, and I want to then repeat what I just said, which is that you have material which is being brought to the tip in terms by these secretory vesicles. These secretory vesicles then lyse, uh, exocytose and endocytose, near the tip. When they do that, they have material inside corresponding to the cell wall, the callose, the cellulose, and the pectin. They also have enzymes, pectin methylesterases and pectin methylesterase inhibitors. And all that really means is these are enzymes which allow the material to be fluid-like or cross-linked in the presence of protons and in the presence of calcium. Okay? So the mechanism that we now understand uh, after about 100 years of work qualitatively is that there is internal turgor. There's uncross-linked material near the tip. That uncross-linked material near the tip and a fluid cell wall allows the fluid cell wall to deform. Near the equator and further back, the cell wall is more or less rigid. So what happens is that you essentially leave a trail behind as the tip moves forward. Okay. If I wanted to think about this at different scales, at different levels, um, as I, I, just, I just told you that you have ions inside. Um, you have these pectin methylesterases and pectin methylesterase inhibitors, which allow or prevent the cell wall from getting cross-linked. And both these together control the turgor pressure by changing the ionic strength relative to the outside. And by changing the amount of cross-linking and uncross-linking, you change the flowability or the rheology of the material. And at the same time, you also have to bring material to the tip. And to bring material to the tip, you have to have an a, 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 a machinery inside the cell. And the machinery inside the cell is associated with the cytoskeletal filaments, with the motor proteins 
and everything that's behind them. We know about the uh, kinds of things that essentially are doing this for us. We are starting to get quantitative about it, but I'm going to just now, from, from now on, focus on what happens at a slightly larger scale. So what happens at this level of where the cell wall mechanics and the assembly, so the ability to flow or not, and the amount of material that's being added, how do they interact with each other and give rise to the geometry? In particular, how do we integrate the mesoscopic or the macroscopic geometry with the rate of addition of material and the rate at which uh, uh, the kinetics of cross-linking and uncross-linking occurs? And eventually, we like to couple it to the molecular mechanochemistry, although I'm going to limit myself to focusing on what happens over here, and I'll show you how the mechanochemistry arises in terms of some parameters which we now have to uh, go after. Okay, what are the questions? The simplest level, the questions that are associated with asking what sets the size of the, of the uh, pollen uh, tube, which means the radius and the height, uh, the thickness, excuse me, and what sets the speed. And in particular, how does it depend on the turgor? And you can control the turgor, you can control the osmolarity outside, you can change the amount of salt inside or outside, and you can also change the, uh, the material properties and the rate at which uh, um, material is coming in, the rheology and also the rate of addition of, of mass. Okay, so we need to have a minimal theory for that, and I'll tell you what that theory is without actually going into any of the details. We need to characterize the geometry. The tube is curved uh, longitudinally, at least close to the tip. It's also curved because it's like a cylinder far away from it, so I have to characterize the curvature. I have to account for the balance of forces across the uh, thin shell in terms of these curvatures, in terms of the stresses, and I have to account for mass balance, and the most important thing that I'd like you to take away from here is that there's a rate of addition of material per unit area per unit thickness, okay? Gamma. And then I have to say something about what the material is made of. What is the cell wall made of? And I'm going to assume that it's the simplest material that you can imagine. It's a liquid, like honey or molasses, very viscous, but it has viscosity which changes. So it's very, very uh, 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 flowable, a low viscosity liquid near the tip, and the viscosity increases as you go further and further away. And how do you control that? You control that by playing with the concentration of the enzymes, the pectin methylesterases and the pectin methylesterase inhibitors. And you would like to track now a number of variables, the velocity, the thickness, and the radius as a function of location and time, okay? Okay, so one very important thing that arises immediately without having to do anything quantitative is that if I'm adding material primarily at the tip and I'm not adding material far away, there must be a characteristic scale over which the material addition rate goes from maximum to zero. So there is at least one length scale in the problem. And you can essentially diagram uh, 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 that in this very simple way where the red curve essentially corresponds to the rate of addition of material, as I said, per unit area, uh, per unit time. So it's maximum at the tip, shown uh, normalized at, at the tip to be one, and then it goes to zero far away over some length scale A. Black is just the integrated version of that. And I've shown that to you over here mathematically. It says that the thickness changes because there is a competition between the rate of addition and the ability to flow. In addition, you have to also worry about the fact that the viscosity, the rheology, is small over here. Uh, uh, viscosity is small, easy to flow here, and much harder to flow. And if you look at the inverse of that, so on the right side, the, the viscosity, the inverse of the viscosity is largest, which means it's, the viscosity is smallest at the tip, and then it goes to infinity as I go far away. And in principle, you can have another scale associated with how quickly the viscosity goes from its smallest value to infinity as you go far away, in addition to the other length scale. And I'll come back to that. But for now, uh, I'm going to assume that the only scale that counts is the, is the transport scale. Why is the viscosity much less than that? Oh, okay, so I, I, I'll, I, I think I, I tried to say that, but I probably went too quickly. Um, the viscosity is very small at the tip because you have these, pectin, these enzymes, and the enzymes prevent the new cellulose and the callose from cross-linking. And the way they prevent that from cross-linking is the way cellulose, for example, cross-linked is, is by protons. So by tuning the concentration of the protons and or tuning the concentration of the calcium, you can play with the flowability. And so, and these, the same vesicles bring both the enzymes, the inhibitors of the enzymes, and also the new material. So there is this intimate competition balance between these three. 
the viscosity starts to increase as I go further and further away because the concentration of the enzymes is just becoming smaller and smaller because of geometry. And so a consequence of that is that it starts to become more and more like a brick layer or an amorphous brick layer as I go further and further away. So the rest state, so it's interesting because the way the pollen tube is built is that if I switch off all the machinery, it doesn't lice, it just stops, everything freezes. That's contrary to how we would build. We would essentially keep everything uh, uh, pliable until we're essentially absolutely sure over here, if there is a problem, you just freeze the whole thing. Okay, so with this characteristic scale, there's just one parameter that appears, and that parameter uh, in, 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 in physical terms corresponds to the ratio of this transport scale relative to a scale that you get from the pressure and the viscosity and the thickness, okay? A mechanical scale compared to a transport scale. And in terms of that, we can essentially very easily, from the equations that I showed you, derive a relationship which connects the radius of the tube to the radius at the tip. So this is a very natural characterization of a tube. Is it a hemisphere? attached to a cylinder, in which case it's got one scale. Is it pointed or is it blunt? So it's, a, it's the simplest characterization of the shape. And we find that the ratio of the tube radius to the tip radius is proportional to that parameter, which is a transport scale divided by mechanical scale to the 2 thirds power. You can, you can compute that uh, from the equations. You can get that more or less from dimensional analysis. But the, again, the only point that I want to share with you over here is that as you change alpha, alpha is the transport scale divided by the tip radius. As alpha increases, you change shape. You go from something which is blunt to something which is more and more pointed. Okay? And there's a specific law which connects those two that I've shown you over here. Okay, so you get that out of the equations. You get that in terms of a single parameter. So at, le at the very least, this model has allowed you to compress a lot of the information that we've known for a very long time. How does this compare? How does this compare across different species, uh, all of which use tip growth, but fundamentally use very different molecules to essentially get at tip growth, okay? So on the bottom, for example, you have water molds. In between, you have green plants. At the top, you have fungi. So fundamentally different kinds of species, organisms, but they're all using the same macroscopic idea, which is to add material at the tip, allow the material to be pliable at the tip, and you essentially get shapes which go from the relatively blunt camellia to something which is much more pointed, the acula. Okay, please. Ah, no, so there, there certainly are other parameters, and I'll come to that in the context of stability, but heat is not important because this is happening too slowly. But, but I will come, that's a, that's, a, that's a very relevant question about how many more parameters there are, and I'll come to that. Okay. Okay. Uh, on the video, I noticed that uh, the tip buckled, which might be advantageous. Good. Yes. Uh, <coughs> advantages for? Uh, avoiding obstacles. Okay, so yes, the tip can buckle. It depends on whether it's supported or not along. So when the pollen grain actually moves through the pistil, in fact, it's fairly tightly confined, so it does not buckle. Um, I, don't, I don't know whether I have anything more to say on, except that. Okay. okay, so can I compare this scaling law with these different, uh, 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 and, and try to make sense of these different shapes in terms of the parameters? In fact, here is a, 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 a suggestion. So uh, uh, the idea is to ask how is the amount of material coming to the tip scaling with the size of the tube? If I'm able to keep up the transport with the size, then I'm going to get similar shapes. While if there is just one organ which is giving you material, then the rate at which the material is essentially coming out is more or less fixed, then the size of the tip will be fixed. So there are two extreme possibilities, and then a whole bunch of possibilities in between. And in fact, if you look around and you look at these different organisms, you find examples of both these extremes, okay? Pollen tubes are associated with the case where the machinery associated with bringing material to the tip, which characterizes its transport scale, scales with the size of the tube. Why is that? It's associated purely with the geometry, because I have more filaments 
associated with a larger diameter, because the amount of filaments essentially will scale with the perimeter. And therefore, I expect to get similar shapes. So the shapes will be the same, which means that the radius of the tube and the radius of the tip will scale with each other. But the sizes will be different. Both R and RA can change. While fungal hyphae have what's called a spitzenkorper, a body near the tip, which essentially extrudes or exudes material. And the rate at which it exudes material is a constant. And a consequence of that would be that the tip radius is kept constant. And therefore, you'll have a tip radius, which is constant, while the size of the tube increases, so similar tips. And this is what you see. Okay? If you now look at different uh, um, uh, tubular uh, wall uh, cells, all of which grow via tip growth, on the left side are examples, different examples of pollen uh, uh, tubes. And on the right, where you see that the radius of the tip scales with the radius of the tube, different uh, constant. And the different constant has to do with the fact that they're different species. While on the right side, you see that the tip radius is a constant. And that's associated with fungi, where you have a spitzenkorper, one body uh, near the tip shown in red on the right side, uh, from where the amount of material that comes out remains constant per unit time. OK? OK, so, so far, I've told you about the fact that this relatively simple model with one scale associated with transport and one scale associated with the mechanical properties can allow you uh, at least some data compression. In the context of morphospaces. spaces, it allows you to characterize this some class of shapes. But there's an important question that I ignored. And the important question is, is it stable? Because I assume that it's steady state. Is this situation stable? And I, I alluded to it right at the beginning because I said, you know, if I don't have this exquisite balance between the rate at which I'm adding material and the rate at which the material is flowing, there's going to be a problem. And in fact, you probably know the way antibiotics work is that when you essentially throw an antibiotic at bacteria, it mucks up the cell wall maintenance machinery. And a consequence of that is the bacteria lice. So you've essentially monkeyed with this imbalance or the balance between the rate of addition of material and the rate of, uh, uh, of deformation. So different context here in the pollen grain. What about stability? Okay. So if you actually analyze the stability of the solutions that I just told you, you find that un except an extremely narrow window of parameters, it's unstable. You either have the wall which thickens without bound, or you have the wall which thins and the whole thing explodes. And the reason for that is associated with the geometry. Because unless I have a perfectly, hemis perfectly hemispherical geometry co connected to a cylinder, and even in that case, the stresses in the hoop-wise direction, just one second, are different from the stresses at the, at the tip. And the consequence of that is you will never be able to maintain stability. Question. I just want to ask, uh, you named uh, two types of instabilities. But what about branching? If there would be two points with, yeah. Mm -hmm. OK. Yeah, so branching, of course, does happen. Fungal hyphae, in fact, explore space by branching. I, uh, so a hypothesis, and there are some experiments which suggest that this is, this is correct, but I don't know of any theories, are that you weaken the wall uh, uh, at some location in the azimuth. And once you weaken the wall at some location, then for the same pressure, you're going to have flow over there. We haven't looked at this. Other people have started to look at that. I want to look at the much simpler case of just uniform growth. But certainly, that's a very important thing. OK. So um, here is uh, uh, how we have, and other people have thought about stability problem by basically asking how I have cell wall material which is being added when you bring in vesicles with a certain amount of material. Uh, and these vesicles lice, and you have exocytosis and endocytosis. And associated with that process, the cell wall starts to get laid down. If I think about now how to essentially put this together mathematically, I'm going to now make an assumption. And this is where the biology really comes in. I'm going to say that the rheology of the material and the rate at which material is being added are not independent parameters, which in glass blowing you can control independently. In any physical system, you can control independently and thicken or thin. Over here, we say, if that's the case, you will not have stability over a wide range of parameters. So instead, you have to essentially uh, ask how this is possible. And here is the hypothesis. The hypothesis is that whenever I have material which is essentially being stretched at a very large rate, then I will have more endocytosis over there in order to account for this. OK, so that's a hypothesis. I'm going to now tell you what the consequences of that are. And then I'm going to suggest how this essentially may be played out in biology, although we don't know. 
We don't know whether or not uh, the details of how this is played out. So the hypothesis essentially is shown with the addition of a new term associated with the rate at which new material is being added. The first bit is associated with just happening passively. So the endocytosis and the exocytosis uh, associated with the vesicles gives you a rate of addition of material, which is the product of uh, a couple of parameters. R is the endocytosis rate. M is the ratio of material in the vesicle uh, relative to the membrane that's added. And, 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 and tau has dimensions of 1 over time. And the second, per, second uh, uh, term is the rate at which new area is being generated. And I need to account for that. <clears throat> so once you do that, you find that you actually have to add two more scales in the problem. The two scales that you add are not only the one that I told you about before, the transport or the, the kinetic rate. I also have this length scale, which I told you about, but I didn't tell you any details because in the first model we didn't have that, which is that there's a characteristic scale over which the viscosity goes from its smallest value at the tip to infinity. I've chosen a particular functional form, the same functional form for all three of these, lengths, uh, these, these parameters, the viscosity, the endocytosis, and the vesicle composition, the amount of new material which is added to the wall compared to the new material which is added to the membrane. I've chosen exponential forms. It doesn't really matter what they are. All that matters for our purposes is that there are three length scales, the viscosity length scale and endocytosis length scale, which decreases as I go from the, uh, the, which says the rate decreases as I go from the tip, and the vesicle composition, which also decreases, because most of the vesicles are at the tip. What does this mean? It means in the context of the parameters, I've introduced two more parameters. Previously, I had one parameter. Now I have two more. And the only thing, again, to take away from that is the fact that when this parameter alpha is small, so if you look at alpha, the most important thing to point out over here is the dependence on the viscosity length scale. If the viscosity length scale is small, that means the viscosity increases very rapidly as I go from the tip. If that's the case, I expect that it's close to being rigid. If it's close to being rigid, you should not have flow, independent of the other two parameters. That's what we would hypothesize. When alpha is small, there's no flow. When alpha is large or comparable to 1, you would have interesting dynamics. Again, rather than show you equations, I want to show you the phase space of shapes that you essentially get. Okay? So here is the phase space of shapes. Alpha, is, remember, is this parameter which tells you how quickly the rheology increases from its lowest value near the tip. So if alpha is small, you expect it's almost rigid, so there's no flow. This vertical axis is, in this case, beta, which is associated with the vesicle composition size, and delta over there, which is associated with the transport length scale. So in either case, when alpha is small, there's no flow. When alpha crosses a threshold, you have flow. And if you have flow, so you actually now have growing pollen tube, you have three different possibilities. The one in green corresponds to the case when the thickness decreases monotonically. And the rate at which the material is also being stretched out decreases monotonically. In pink is the case when the thickness actually is opposite what you would think. The thickness is not its largest value at the tip and decreases. The thickness is small and then increases. And that's because the shape itself changes. The shape is starting to become flatter. So you have more curvature near the flanks. And if you have more curvature, then you're adding more material. You have to add more material. And so consequence is that the thickness has to essentially go up. While in purple, you essentially have a situation where the flow rates, the rate at which the material is moving, is again, uh, not again, is, is non-monotonic, while the thickness is monotonic. Why is this interesting? It's interesting because over the last 50 years, people have postulated all kinds of complex mechanisms for why you get monotonicity in the thickness or not and monotonicity or, or, or not in the rate at which new material is being added. And I'm saying that the same model, if you just take the parameters and you move them around, allow you to explain these. So again, it's not saying that the model is correct. It simply says that this minimal picture perhaps might be useful in designing new experiments. And I want to close the story of the pollen tube by telling you about not only can it explain these steady situations, but it can also explain dynamical transitions. So this is a paper which was published um, a few years ago. And I'll just read out the title, actually, because it's interesting. A polar growth in pollen tubes associated with uh, dynamical changes in cell mechanical properties. And let me explain the experiment. So the experiment was uh, that you have a pollen tube which is growing in uh, water uh, plus medium, which allows the pollen tube to grow. And then at some point, you suddenly 
reduce the turgor. Okay? And when you uh, 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 um, uh, reduce the turgor, you find that the wall starts to thicken because you're adding material now at a rate which is faster than allow it to move. And so the wall starts to thicken, which you can actually see over here. Not only does the wall start to thicken, it forms a bulb. It's intuitive. And then you again increase the turgor, and the whole thing goes back to its uh, original state. Okay? So in the context of this phase diagram, this parameter alpha, which had pressure or the turgor in the numerator, has been suddenly reduced at some time and then increased. In the context of the phase diagram, what's really happening is you're traversing in the horizontal direction, not in the case of, uh, not in the uh, pink or the purple regime, in the green regime, where, as I said, both the thickness and the strain rate vary monotonically. And on the right side, you see solutions associated with this. What does this mean? It means, again, that in terms of these three parameters and equations, which essentially are just Newton's laws, and this very important idea that I need to have feedback. I can't add material or take away material at a rate which is not consistent with the rate at which new material is being uh, uh, able to flow. If I have that feedback, we can start to compress the information that a large number of experiments essentially give us. Okay? What, what, so what? Okay? So what? I've told you that this extremely simple model allows you to combine geometry with the rate of addition of material and kinetics. I've completely ignored the molecular mechanochemistry by postulating the presence of three length scales. How would you do better? The natural thing would be to say, I have now the ability to move through this machinery that I told you, material to the tip, and the rate at which that material can be added to the uh, wall and the concentration of enzymes, which changes the rheology. So these three length scales may not be actually constant. They may be dynamical variables. And that's where we are. How do we essentially put that in is where we are. So the theory is still in its incipient stages. It is starting to couple things which one expects, one, 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 one thinks should be coupled, but it still lacks an important aspect. And that aspect is coupling what happens at the mesoscale to what happens at the molecular scale. What is the kinetics of the vesicle transport? What is the kinetics of the vesicle lysing? And how do they change the rate at which the material can flow and the rate at which new material is brought to it? Okay. So that's, it's a question. It's, it's sharpened because of the ability to make simple models, but it's not been answered. But I think that's OK, because that's, I think, the primary role of theory in many biological problems. How do you sharpen the question? A second kind of question that one can ask is, not only so what, but is this useful in other places? And I will just indicate through pictures uh, how it is and how it isn't. So if I look at bacteria rather than uh, uh, pollen tubes, much smaller scale now, uh, a, a few microns at best, uh, it turns out that in many bacteria, the cell wall is almost crystalline. And the way in which material is added is very different. You essentially have motors which are moving along. You have dislocations which form, and these dislocations mediate essentially the ability to add material and take away material. What people have done over the last few years is to look at how the material itself is deforming and how these dislocations move around. What has not been done is coupling it to the way in which new matter is being added. And also what's not been done is the ability to connect it to the internal dynamics, the pressure which is driving it. Okay? So you have to couple these scales. People have started to make sense of what happens on the wall, but haven't really combined it with what happens uh, when you account for both mass balance and this global force balance, not just the local force balance. So some of these ideas may be relevant there. In a different setting, the same pollen grain can shrivel if you essentially dry it out. And this is an extremely effective way of being transported. Um, so it changes its hydrodynamic radius. Sorry, it keeps its hydrodynamic radius approximately constant. Uh, but its density becomes much smaller because you've lost all the water, and so that allows you to essentially transport it much more easily. Again, a similar theory might be useful over there, except that now you have strong constraints on what kinds of deformations are possible. And then finally, on a larger scale, there are lots of examples of how tubes and vesicles form with tissues. One recent example from Sean Megason's group at Harvard Medical School uh, 
ask the question of how the inner ear forms. And the inner ear is quite a spectacular organ. It allows us uh, not only to hear, but also associated with, uh, with balance. Uh, and there are three semicircular canals. And these semicircular canals take a featureless slab of tissue and convert it to an object with three handles. So it changes the topology, and it also has this very, very beautiful physiological function. And Sean Megason's group recently has started to address the question of how regulation of the pressure allows this tissue to grow into a vesicle and then simultaneously maintain the size of the vesicle. Because you have two ears and you have two vesicles, and if you essentially shut down one and then you allow the other to grow and vice versa, you essentially see that they, will, they, they, they are independent, but they're able to regulate the pressure as soon as you switch on uh, uh, or increase the amount of ions inside or outside, they're able to essentially uh, uh, re-regulate themselves. So it's the same, same kind of theory. Of course, there are, there are details associated with accounting, for example, for the crystalline nature, accounting for the kind of deformation, and accounting now for tissue scale properties rather than cell scale properties. So this is really, this first part is really a, 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 a very much a work in progress. Um, and I want to now switch to a, a, a piece of work which is slightly more advanced, um, which is now thinking about a whole tube. But at the same time, I'm willing to also stop now and take questions if there are any in this part. I, I have a... Yeah. Speak. OK. Um, in, in the uh, video you, you showed of the flow in the, uh, in the pollen tube, yeah. uh, the, the flow comes in along the wall and uh, and, and there's an inverse yeah. fountain. I, is that simply a question of the of uh, friction, of the way the filaments of the are, are the way the filaments are arranged? So the polarity of the actin is such that the motors will essentially bring the vesicles along the periphery and then we'll move back along the center. So it's not, uh, the, the, the friction along the wall is not. No, uh, no. But, the, but there's a subtle question that I think underlies what you asked, which is how did the polarity get laid in the first place? Mm -hmm. And we don't know in this particular case, in some other situations, people are starting to get a handle on that. Mm -hmm. There was another question over here. Uh, um, I wonder if you'd care to speculate about the aspect ratio in, say, a vertebrate limb. I, I read some of Tabin's stuff more than a decade ago, and I know he was at least thinking a little bit in that direction. I noticed you're collaborating with him. So wh what's the state of the art in terms of the biology and in terms of the kind of mathematics? Can, can, you, can you hold off on that question sure. until I finish the larger scale problem? Sure. If you don't mind. OK. So if you have questions, interrupt me. But otherwise, I will continue and tell you about a second problem. And the problem is the problem of how the gut is patterned. And I want to focus. Uh, because, in fact, uh, we have fantastic collaborators in Cliff Tabin and his group who spent a lot of time thinking about the chick. I want to focus on the chick because they introduced us to this question. Okay? So what is the question? So the question is how did the chick uh, uh, develop uh, in broad terms? And in this specific context, how did the gut essentially develop? And the gut is a simple, relatively simple organ. It's tubular. Um, uh, yet, it's got a length which is much larger and potentially than the organism uh, itself, just like in us. As I said, in us, we have eight or nine meters of gut uh, embedded inside a, a, a belly, which hopefully doesn't grow too large uh, with time. OK, so this is the chick uh, uh, three days after uh, it has been fertilized. The egg uh, has been fertilized. And what you see over here is the forebrain. Um, this is what eventually becomes a vertebra. And you see this gut, which is incipiently herniating out. Okay, so this is a view. It's a cross view. The gut is starting to herniate out. And about um, uh, four or five years ago, perhaps longer, uh, Cliff's group had started to get interested in understanding how this gut essentially broke left-right symmetry. In fact, they've thought about breaking of left-right symmetry in organs uh, for a very long time. And they discovered that, in fact, there is the expression of a particular gene called PITEX2 which allows for proliferation of cells, or it causes proliferation of cells more on one side compared to the other. So you can see that the gut doesn't separate from the body. It's connected uh, to two holes, uh, to a hole at either end. So the gut attached also to the body with, by a piece of tissue called the mesentery. And this mesentery essentially is not proliferating the same, at the same rate on one side compared to the other. And I'll show you images of that. So they found that about three days into 
the, 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 the process, uh, the mesentery essentially starts to, de to, to grow a little more on one side compared to the other. And a consequence of that is this gut, which is incipiently lying in the plane uh, of symmetry of the organism, turns a little bit. And it turns to essentially have an incipient uh, uh, handedness. Okay? If you wait uh, longer, so that's three days, this is five days, you see that this is starting to form the beginning of a helix. Uh, um, and then you wait still longer, you get more turns, and now 16 days, uh, so I should tell you that the chick hatches at about 21 days, and about 16 days the whole gut is laid out. And then after that, uh, the gut and the body grow at the same rate. Until that time, the gut grows relative to many other organs in the body, and that's why you essentially have this tremendous change in length. So about 16 days is when the whole process is stopped, and you get this stereotypical coiled pattern of the gut inside the chick. Okay, so here is a larger view of the same thing, uh, 15 days into uh, 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 past fertilization, and the size of the gut has grown from about seven millimeters over here by a factor of almost 20, so 150 millimeters in length. And it's got this very nice coiled shape. How does this happen? And the fact that it's reproducible uh, suggests that perhaps there is uh, some rule. Um, now, as I said, Cliff's group had already worked out what was happening in the early stages of this uh, uh, handedness, and so they thought that Perhaps, uh, well, actually, before that, they thought maybe it's a problem of packing. You know, you have this long tubular structure which is sitting inside the body, uh, and it's constrained in all different directions. Maybe it's just a solution of a packing problem. And the answer is no. And how do you find out experimentally? You just take the gut away from all its anchors, and I'm not going to show you images. It's not the solution of a packing problem. So the second uh, idea was that perhaps it's associated with the same thing that, as I said, broke left-right symmetry. You just grow the gut. So if I was over here, then I grow the gut uh, uh, on one side compared to the other. And over here, I grow the tube this a uh, little more on one side compared to the other. And over there, I grow it there compared to this side, and so on. So you have effectively a master puppeteer. So somebody who's continuously controlling uh, the rate of proliferation. Okay? Is that true? So the answer is uh, uh, experimentally testable. And how do you do that? So first of all, I want to show you now the gut and the mesentery. So this is the gut tube. This is the body, which is not being shown over here. And at E3, at this stage, you see that one part of the mesentery is essentially growing relative to the other, causing the, the gut tube to essentially become handed. But as you wait, this mesentery, this thick slab of tissue, is becoming diaphanous and extremely thin. Okay? So much so that at 16 days, you see the gut at the bottom, the body is not even visible, and that mesentery has become a very, very thin, two layer thick, two cell layer thick piece of tissue. How do we test the idea that it's a master puppeteer or not? What you do is look for cell proliferation. So you stain, you look for stains, uh, an EDU stain, which allows you to characterize cell proliferation. You first look in the azimuth. So this is a cross section of the gut, and you can look at this at different locations, and you find the red. Uh, dots tell you where cell proliferation is present, and you find that there is no asymmetry, obvious asymmetry. You can do that at different locations, you see the same thing. You can also look at what happens uh, along the mesentery. So uh, at the top, you see now the cell proliferation patterns along the axis of the gut, and you see no variation at all, all the way along the gut, and what's been shown in the center is where the loops would actually have been. No variation. At the bottom, you see exactly the same question answered, but for the mesentery. So, the, so the, as I said, this is the tube, and there's a piece of tissue, and you can ask how the tissue is growing. And when you do that, you find that the tissue is growing also more or less uniformly along its entire length. But what you do see is that the rate of proliferation of the tissues, uh, of the cells in the tissue, is a factor of 10 less than that in the gut. So even though each tissue is growing, at the same rate, along itself, the two tissues are growing relative to each other. Okay? And if that was the case, and you cut away the mesentery, what should you get? What will you get? You find that that gut, which is this coiled structure with the mesentery, when you cut away the mesentery, what you end up with is the mesentery, which is shrunk a little bit, not a whole lot, and the gut completely straightens out. So what is this saying? It's saying, that in fact, and, and, and on the right side, is the same thing is quantified. In blue is the length of the gut as a function of time. 
and in red is the length of the boundary where the gut is attached to the body through this mesentery. And you clearly see the gut is growing much more than the mesentery. So it's a very simple idea. One tissue grows relative to the other, just like Darcy Thompson suggested, and the whole thing causes the system to compact. It suggests, therefore, a physical way to think about the problem. A tube, a piece of tissue, you stretch the tissue, you stitch it to the tube, and you let the whole thing relax. Because if you stretch it, and you stitch it, and you let it relax, it will put the tissue in tension, and it will put the gut in compression. Because the tissue has been stretched enormously, you stitch the gut, so the gut is being compressed, the tissue is being stretched. You can do that experiment, and here is the result. Okay. With a piece of rubber and a piece of tube. And I'll just pass this around. And you see that you recapture that complex behavior in terms of this very simple physical experiment. Okay? It's very important to recognize that you must satisfy a topological constraint, and the topological constraint is because the object, because the tube is attached to the body everywhere, even though, as I said at the beginning, it's incipiently got chirality, it can't really have chirality, because it, once it's attached, every time it tries to twist on one side, it has to essentially make up the twist on the other side, which is quantified in terms of this theorem from topology uh, called the Calagheranu white uh, theorem, which links link to twist and write. And I'll just leave it at that. I'm not going to detail. Okay? So here is the same experimental uh, 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 object that I just am passing around, uh, stitched by uh, uh, Patricia Florescu, who's an undergraduate working with me. You take the gut, you cut away the major blood vessel that you actually see indicated in red. And this is the gut. So you capture it. And of course, when you have a hammer in your hand, the whole world looks like a nail. So you go around, and you see whether you see the same pattern elsewhere. And I did, OK, on a storefront. Um, this is a stole, which cost a few thousand dollars. Uh, and that experiment cost a dollar. So the same pattern has been actually patented by this person, Susan Ehrman. Um, and, and everything in the store has essentially got that theme. OK, so we understand it physically can we essentially understand it quantitatively? So can we quantify the growth? And the answer is yes. You just measure the changes in the dimensions of the diameter of the gut and the length of the red mesentery along the boundary where it's attached to the tube and the length of the tube. And on the right side, you clearly see in blue, the gut is growing much more than the tube, than the mesentery. Okay? So that's the cause of the compression on the gut. You can measure the mechanical properties of both the gut and the mesentery. and this is a half a talk in itself. I won't get into the details. And you can measure how much that relative uh, 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 growth uh, and these mechanical properties lead to differential strain. You can construct a computational model where you model the membrane as uh, the, the mesentery as a thin membrane and the gut as an elastic tube. And then you basically change the length of the mesentery compared to the gut. And you ask what patterns arise. Uh, in terms of some parameters, which I'll indicate in a minute, but I'll first show you the results of computations. And you see that for different values of these parameters, you get different size uh, 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 patterns. So the wavelength changes, the amplitude changes. Uh, lambda is the, is the wavelength. R is the radius of the, uh, uh, of the pattern uh, uh, at its maximum uh, amplitude. Um, and you can also do a little uh, uh, um, analytical argument, which minimizes the energy of the system corresponding to the gut plus the mesentery and a, a balance of forces and torques. Uh, and the point is that you get an explicit expression which tell you what the wavelength is in terms of the mechanical properties of the gut, in terms of the mechanical properties of the mesentery, in terms of the geometry of the gut, and in terms of the thickness of the mesentery. So those are the two, those are the four parameters, all of which are measurable. And so if you measure those parameters um, and you substitute into this, this little equation, for the chick at different stages, for the rubber models, for the computational results, and for that simple scaling law, you seem not to do too bad a job. So in green are the physical experiments. In purple are the computations, which are the cheapest. In black is the uh, um, chick experiment at different stages in time, eight days after fertilization, 12 days, and 16 days. And the straight line corresponds to these two scaling laws. So you can get both. So then you get greedy. and uh, 
you try to ask whether the same thing is true in other organisms. Okay, so in the 19th, uh, late 19th century, uh, people tried to essentially look at the diets of birds and try uh, look at the length of the intestine of birds and predict the diet. Uh, thousand years ago, people tried to predict the future even by looking at the entrails of animals, and we can't do that yet. Uh, um, but we certainly can ask whether or not we can divine what happened in the past or as a function of time in different birds and different organisms. So this is the chick. The quail was chosen. Cliff's group has a long history of working uh, 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 with uh, a large variety of organisms to study how development uh, uh, and evolution are connected. Um, the quail was chosen because the egg of the quail is much smaller. So size is not important. Shape is the finch, again, because they've worked on these problems and the genetics of the mice being very different from that of the chick, the, mice was, the mouse was chosen as a test. But again, this is a physical theory, so it shouldn't have any dependence, and indeed it doesn't. Okay, so both the wavelength and the radius are um, uh, uh, compare well. Okay. The same principle actually is seen elsewhere, not just in animal morphogenesis, it's seen in plants. Uh, if you have tendrils growing in your garden or indoors, uh, you find that tendrils essentially coil up. And not only do they coil up, that they actually have what is called the perversion, a place where the chirality reverses. Okay? And the reason is, again, the tendril starts to coil up because one end is attached to, oh, when it starts to coil up, one end is attached to the plant, another end is attached to a, a substrate. And it coils up because there is a fiber inside the tendril which starts to become woody. So part of it is starting to become woody, so the whole thing contracts, but the fiber is not central, so it starts to form a helix. But now there's a problem, just like for the gut. This conservation uh, law, uh, topological conservation law, has to essentially work, which means that if I have part of it which is coiled in one direction, it has to coil up somewhere in the other direction. This was already observed by Darwin. And our little explanation suggests that it's associated with, again, a differential shrinkage rather than a differential growth. You see this in leaves. You see this uh, same principle uh, in a different setting. In the leaf, the edge has not got a tube, but the edge is simply growing more than the center. And a consequence of that is that a flat leaf will immediately start to essentially take complex shapes because one part of it is growing relative to the other. And then you can even come up with a phase space. And then finally, you can see this in flowers in the context of blooming. And the difference between a leaf and a flower from a mathematical point of view is that the leaf is approximately flat. A flower has got an elliptic uh, shape originally when it's in its bud state and it's hyperbolic, more like a saddle when it's blooming. The question is, how does it happen? And the surprising result is it happens because the edge of the flower petal grows more than the center rather than one surface growing relative to the inside. Okay, so this suggests that this general principle has been stumbled upon multiple times, no surprises, um, and um, uh, therefore it's probably useful to study not just biologically but also mathematically. So I want to finish by telling you what happens inside the gut. So the gut, of course, in the end, uh, in you and me and in all organisms, uh, has in fact uh, protrusions which allow for maximal absorption of nutrients. So this is the gut about six days and the inside is relatively smooth. And the right side image is a smooth lumen. So you make a cut and you look down, you see a smooth lumen. You wait a few days, and two things are obvious. Uh, first, four days later, in green is a label for smooth muscle uh, actin, so muscle differentiation has occurred first. And second, the inside is no longer smooth, the inside has got ridges. Okay, so imagine this is the tube, and, uh, uh, and I make a cut this way, and I have longitudinal ridges. Okay, so you see the ridges over there. That is about 10, between 10 and 12 days after fertilization. You wait a little longer, a second layer of muscles develops. A second layer of muscles, particularly visible over here, at the base over here, that's a different layer than that. How do I know this? Because of the way the, the actomyosin is actually oriented. So if this is the axis of the tube, the first layer of muscles are oriented azimuthally. And if the tissue is growing, the inside is growing to the outside, then the inside is essentially going to buckle. The second thing that happens is now you develop a second layer of muscles on the outside of the first layer, but in the longitudinal direction. And now that puts the tissue into compression longitudinally. And the ridges that are formed now are going to start to zigzag. And that's what you see here. And then the third thing that happens, if you wait still longer, oh, I should say that these zigzags have been known in many different pattern-forming systems. Um, 
they are also actually seen in this beautiful or, uh, origami structure invented by a Japanese uh, engineer and mathematician, Miura. And they are the result, in this case, of, of painstaking folding, but in the biological situation, they just spontaneously arise. Okay? So if you wait still longer, a third layer of muscles develops, and the third layer of muscles shown over here is also azimuthal. So this is my tube. The first layer is azimuthal. The second layer is longitudinal on the outside, and the third layer is inside, and again azimuthal. And then what happens is that the zigzags get compressed, and then if they get compressed, they form these elbows. And when these elbows are in tightly enough compressed, what happens is that the arm of the elbow comes out at one location and starts to overlap the, 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 the arm of the next one. So you get uh, arms which move in and out, and those are the beginnings of villi. There's long protrusions that you perhaps have heard about in your intestines which allow for maximal absorption. Okay? How is this happening? So in fact, it's the same principle again. How do we know? So Amy Shire um, used her hair to do surgery. So she took out the hair, stretched it between two, um, uh, two points, thin enough, and then she separated the layers. Okay? So the, the same experiment done at different stages. At the top, you see the uh, mesenchyme and the endoderm, the inner tissue the inside the muscle. You, you, she, she separated the, so this is the whole gut preparation. You separate the inner layer inside the muscle, and you find that it actually opens up. Okay? What you see over here, this slight white colored tissue has, when you release it from the inside, opens up. But the muscle outside hasn't really changed. And that's even more obvious over here. I hope you can see at least from the front rows. This is the muscle layer, slightly darker. This is the mesenchyme plus the endoderm on the inside. You release the mesenchyme plus the endoderm by slicing uh, using a, piece, a, a hair. You slice away the inside. The inside opens up, gets relieved, while the muscle doesn't change. So it's the same process that I told you before. One tissue growing relative to the other, but very importantly, the muscle playing the role of constraints. Now, muscle is, of course, active. So you can ask whether the activity has anything to do with it and uh, whether or not the muscle is the most important thing. So you can use drugs. Um, to eliminate the formation of muscle, but these drugs only eliminate the formation of muscle. They don't change the proliferation. So what happens is the whole gut grows, but you see no more of the ridges. You don't see the wrinkles. You change the activity of the muscle. So you allow the muscle to form, and you can use drugs which essentially prevent contractions. That doesn't change. So what does this say? It says that the muscle is important because it constrains, but the activity of the muscle is not important. And then to confirm that even further, you can essentially prevent the muscles from forming, but then you constrain the gut inside a silk cocoon, which was given to us by David Kaplan's lab at Tufts. And when you do that, what you find is that in the absence of any constraint, you don't get ridges, but if you constrain it, you get ridges. So it's showing that if you just constrain it, you rescue the morphology. You can do the same thing at different stages. If you allow the first layer to form, first layer of muscles to form, but prevent the second one, you form ridges but you don't form zigzags. You then do the same experiment at a slightly later la uh, time. So you allow the second layer to form, you form zigzags, but you don't allow the third layer to form. And on the bottom right, you will see that the zigzags are maintained. So what am I saying? I'm saying that these three timed muscle layers break three symmetries, and you get this beautiful patterning when you go from a smooth lumen to ridges to zigzags to villi. And then when you account for that first symmetry breaking, when I said the gut itself is growing relative to the mesentery, you also allow the whole thing to fold up. So four very simple processes allow you to essentially go from a featureless tube to a fairly complex vilified gut. Okay? How do you construct a mathematical model? Well, so we use now uh, elasticity theory. Why do we know elasticity is good enough? Because I told you I can rescue the morphology by just taking one tissue and separating it from the other. All right, so you can actually do this um, not only to get at the gut, um, uh, to form ridges, as you can see in cross section over here, but then as you compress it in the axial direction, which is not visible, but it's visible because of the perspective, you also start to see the formation of zigzags. Okay? All right, so 
what does this lead to? So the last thing that I need to tell you is how do you form villi? I already told you how you form villi, but it's slightly trickier than what I actually let on. So let me just tell you the whole story. The story is a little more complex. So I think I mentioned to you that one way to essentially track whether or not cells are dividing is to use this EDU stain. And these experiments done by Amy Shire show something extremely interesting. They show that initially there is no pattern. Cells are proliferating everywhere. But at about E14 and E15, you see cells which are stopping to divide near the tips. Okay? Why is this interesting? Because that's precisely the time when two things happen. First, you go from zigzags to villi. And second, for people who think about stem cells and, and crypts and all the complexity associated with that, this is the time when you're switching from the embryological gut to something which is starting to become more and more like an adult. And you're seeing that the geometry is starting to play a role in where expression levels are essentially associated with whether or not proliferation is occurring. So that's extremely interesting, and this is something we are thinking about now. I'm happy to answer questions on. Uh, from that, from that, taking, that, taking that literally suggests that, therefore, growth is now changing as a function of radius. Okay? How do we understand that? So one way to understand that is, to, again, to build models. And so Amy Shire built a clay model, started to compress the zigzags. And then in order to mimic the fact that places which are close to the tip, close to the top, are not proliferating, and places which are at the bottom are proliferating, would mean that because of proliferation, you develop a pressure. And so the part, the elbow, starts to come out and then starts to overlap. Okay? And that's what's shown in this set of sequences with the clay model and at the top, we interpret that as happening in the, uh, in the experiments, where the arms form eventually the villi, and the elbows start to get buried in. And again, you can build that in into a calculation. Okay, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to show you that. Um, again, you get greedy. If you can understand that is in one organism, can you understand that in others? Classical model for this, of course, is the mouse. Uh, what you find in the mouse is that you essentially go from something which is smooth almost instantaneously to something which is vilified. You don't see the different stages. How do we understand that? It's just the timing. Rather than have the three broken symmetries happen one after the other, you essentially squash them all together. And when you squash them all together, then they all happen more or less simultaneously, which is what you see on the right side. So you go from something which is relatively smooth, 12 and a half days post-fertilization, um, and you start to get villi at about 16 uh, days. By the way, the mouse is also born uh, about 20, 25 days. And again, you can make a mathematical model, um, which essentially shows you the same thing. You look at a slightly different organism. You look at the frog, Xenopus, which a lot of people uh, like to study for uh, um, uh, various aspects of development. Um, and what happens now over there is that you have only two broken symmetries. So you have only two layers. Rather than have three layers, you have question. Uh, are the villi uh, some sort of energy minimum, or are the history important? Uh, history is important. They are local energy minima, but where you started does seem to will matter, not does seem to will matter. Yeah. In the frog, you have only two layers of muscles, so layer one and then layer two. And what do you expect? You go from smooth to ridges to zigzags, and you stop there. That's what you see in uh, the development, and we understand that. And in, this, in, a, in a snake, uh, Olivia Purki, who is a developmental biologist in, uh, in Strasbourg, um, who in fact is going to start at Harvard in a couple of months, uh, uh, gave us snakes where you essentially have tension in the gut which varies along its length. And as that tension varies, you get different patterns. On the top, uh, sorry, uh, on the left side are uh, patterns from the proximal and the distal, so closer to the head and closer to the tail. And the patterns change. And, you shouldn't be surprised that if you change the tension, the pattern itself changes. OK. Same question as in the first problem. So what? I've given you the beginnings of a geometrical and a physical basis, uh, which is really simple. Darcy Thompson already had it. All we've done is dash the t's and uh, cross the t's and, 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 and dotted the i's. Uh, um, what can we do from here? So the form of the villi suggests that perhaps it may have something to do with how the brain gyrifies. And I don't know. This is something that is very much work in progress. So Thomas Tallinen, who, as I said, did all the computations in the case of the gut, 
uh, has started to think about this problem now in the case of the brain. And the picture that I, I'd like you to have is that the brain is also a layered structure, the cortex and, 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 and uh, 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 the white matter below. And then the cortex essentially is known to expand. And, and, and particularly, people care a lot about it in an evolutionary setting as to when did this massive expansion leading to gyrification occur. All we want to suggest, all uh, uh, that's really being suggested over here is that just that one parameter, just the fact that the cortex is able to expand more than the interior is sufficient combined with the fact that it's no longer flat but it's curved. It's combined with these two things. All that, that's all that's required to explain what in neuroanatomy is called gyrification. Namely, that when the radius of the uh, uh, brain is, is, is becoming larger and larger compared to the thickness of the cortex. Uh, and uh, when the tangential expansion is essentially becoming larger and larger, so the surface is growing relative to the interior, you go from something which is relatively smooth to something which becomes more and more wrinkled. And you need nothing else. That's it. That's, that's sufficient. Is this what's happening? We don't know. So we are starting to talk to people in neuroanatomy uh, at Harvard and elsewhere to see whether it's possible to follow it. It's hard to do these experiments in any organism for obvious ethical reasons, but one place where people have started to think about this is the ferret, because a lot of neuro uh, <laughs> development occurs after the ferret is born, so it's actually possible to essentially track these things. Last thing, in the first problem I told you about an attempt to build in regulation, an attempt to build in feedback between the rate at which matter is being added and the rate at which matter is moving around. Here, the experiments that I showed you that Amy Shire did, which show that you in fact have the tips of the zigzags which stop proliferating as they form, suggest, and only suggest at this point, that perhaps the geometry and the strain associated with the tissue may be playing an important role. And an experiment that I want to just describe to you that Amy Shire did, just before she went on to a postdoc, is she took a slice of the gut and just inverted it. So the inside became the outside, and the outside became the in inside. And because it's possible to culture the gut in uh, a dish for up to 48 hours, you can then look for uh, expression patterns of LGR5, these stem cell markers, um, and, and, um, and also follow proliferation and ask whether there is a change. And it is, we all, I mean, this is still very much a suggestion at this point. We think that the geometry of the tissue is starting to play an important role in how signaling itself is happening. We don't know, and there are a whole bunch of experiments that need to be done, because you can essentially knock out Sonic, you can knock out Wnt on all these different pathways associated with how these LGR5 markers essentially arise. Still early stages. OK, so I want to stop. I told you um, what Darcy Thompson told us, but we added a, a, a tiny bit of quantification, uh, namely that um, uh, reversible or irreversible deformation plus feedback and regulation can shape both cells and tissues. Um, and uh, it, it is possible to take this wish and this uh, uh, mandate or, uh, or, or uh, evocation that he essentially had uh, 100 years ago when he said cell and tissue and leaf and flower are portions of matter. And it's been the laws of physics that the particles have been moved more and conformed. Perhaps it's possible to start thinking about these problems. A very important part is the regulation. We are starting to, to nibble at the edges. Uh, we've solved part of the problem, the physical end. Uh, 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 what's interesting and what's important is the rest of it. And I would be uh, not true to myself if I didn't also say that there are all kinds of cool math problems that this suggests. But I'll just leave a list of them. And thank you very much.